morning, Glenmore Church. Peace of the Lord be with you. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning, friends. Welcome to this hour of worship. We're here together. It's cool. To, we, Robin and I figured out how to put the fans on high. So, Except number three. This one doesn't want to cooperate, but we're, we're working on that. Our technicians and our engineers are working on that as we speak. So I welcome you to this hour of worship. We're studying Luke this morning, just again, uh, our third, our fourth week in a row where we're delving into the gospel according to Luke and what he has to say. We're, I'm using the rich fool to, uh, to bring a message about, uh, about a meaning in life. When, when our feet hit the ground each morning, are we trusting God with every detail? We say, I'm not sure, Dan. We're going to go to Hebrews. Our second reading is from Hebrews and uh, God speaking to Abraham and just what Abraham went through every morning when his feet hit the ground. And then one day, God says, I want you to go to this land. I want you to go to this land where you don't know where you're going. You allow me, you trust me uh, to lead the way. So uh, those are our texts this morning. I, uh, I ask that you uh, prepare for worship in prayer. I ask that you... Uh, Open your, your bulletins and sing with us these lyrics, this prelude music that we've put together for you. I honor you today. I'm blessed by your presence. Welcome to worship here at Glenmore United Methodist Church. All I see is the battle. You see my victory. Oh God, that belongs to you and every 
we get up, every day we hit the ground, and what do we say? I'm going to trust my own instincts. I'm not going to trust God today because I can't be bothering God with this problem or that problem or this trite or that trite. No, no, Scripture says we got to trust Him as soon as we hit the ground. We hit the ground running. He says, I've got everything under control. We just got to get America to buy that, right? Amen? Amen? We're going to study Luke. We're going to study the 12th chapter. We're going to read Scripture. We're going to learn about Abraham's life and how he trust, trusted God until the end, even by offering his own son. So let's continue as we celebrate today in worship. Thank you for coming. stand and greet one another and pass the peace saying peace of the Lord be with you today and the peace of the Lord and the peace of the Lord be with you
Peace the Lord be with you. Peace the Lord. I'm looking down here for a second. <clears throat> Raymond, good morning. Good to see you. Good to see you. Hey, guys. Welcome, guys. Welcome. What's going on? Got your, got your nice bracelet on. Well, good to see you. Good to see you. Hi, Karen. Hi. As you can see in the uh, windows, we have uh, these backpacks, just a little composite of what we're going to be putting together this week for uh, students. 139 backpacks are going out to students here. So I just wanted to say a prayer and to more or less consecrate these backpacks today and pray for each student that gets one of these that, that they'll be faithful in their studies, faithful in going to school, faithful in their, uh, in their promises and faithful in their, in their studying and also uh, thinking about where they came from and the, and the blessing uh, that we're going to bestow upon them. So point to one of them. Just kind of do this as I enter into a short prayer. So we'll, we'll point to them. We'll bow our heads. We'll pray. And we'll ask God to bless thee. So let's pray. Let's pray together. Father, you are the great provider of all things, God. And we, we just want to stop first and praise you and, and thank those that, uh, that uh, bought these uh, supplies, Lord. May they be blessed. May they be consecrated in your name, in Jesus' name, that every student that gets a backpack, Lord, be blessed, that their year would be blessed with safety, with protection, with a, a mind and a heart, Lord, that turns to you, that trusts you, Father, completely, and to a family, Father, that, that turns to you for answers, God. Your word is power. Your word is the, the, the lamp to our feet, Father. So when we hit the ground, when these students hit the ground every day, when they climb on a school bus or get in a car or walk into, this cl into these classrooms, Lord, that you're with them, we're praying all of this in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen and amen. Thank you. Thank you for that. Just a few announcements uh, before we get into the heart of worship. Um, how many shop with Amazon Smile? We need to, to, to sign up for Amazon Smile. Reason why is the church gets a percentage of all the dough that you spend on Amazon. Mike, you had a word about that. Let me get a, let me get a mic for you. Okay. All right. go. So please, don't shop on Amazon anymore. Just go to Amazon Smile. What is that called? Amazon Smile. Very good. Smile. Go to Amazon Smile. And just click on it, and then you go down to where it says, who do you want to go to? The Lenboy United Methodist Church. And then every time you go to it, it goes to us. A few pennies every time. So you buy that thing you don't want. Thank you, Mike. Thank you, Mike. And the instructions to do that, very simple. They're in the back in the community room, so we trust that. We trust that, of course. It's on the table right there. Yeah, wonderful. Thank you, Michael. Thank you, Michael. Still looking for volunteers for our nursery. We're interviewing our uh, staff person. Uh, I'm meeting with, uh, with one candidate uh, next Monday. And uh, um, we're still looking for that candidate, but we're also looking for the volunteer, the, the complementary uh, two that are necessary to be in our nursery. So if you're interested, please let the office know that. 
Um, our Methodist women are still collecting uh, new and gently used books in the back. All this stuff is going to be gone one day, friends, but until that time, um, any game, uh, board games, any books, uh, periodicals, you can put in the back, and it all goes to the Honeybrook Food Pantry. Interested in joining the church? You call, you talk to Robin, she gets in touch with me here on the opposite side of her, and we start the process of membership. Um, reminding you that your uh, little church, cardboard church bank, is in the back. Uh, has a slot, not just for coins, but for dollars, so take one of those. Uh, it goes, everything goes to the roof project, the roof funding project now. Uh, we continue to uh, gracefully uh, accept offerings. We've raised over $45,000 to pay back this uh, $139,000 roof project, so we're praising God for that and uh, it keeps heading north. Looking for liturgists for the month of September and October, still looking for that. We've blessed the backpacks and uh, just a brief little uh, set of statistics. I love numbers, but the, our Salvation Army donations to date are 1,146 separate items with, uh, with July being the best uh, month so far. So I'm thankful for that. Thank you for... Uh, for giving to that worthy, worthy ministry um, and uh, continue to do that. I urge you to continue to do that. So with those announcements, um, I'll ask Bill, <clears throat> excuse me, to lead us in our call to worship. Bill, and would you rise, please? Good morning. Good morning, Bill. Please join me in the call to worship. Listen to this, all you people. Pay attention, everyone in the world. <laughs> High and low, rich and poor, Listen, for my words are wise, and my thoughts are filled with insight. Why should I fear when trouble comes, when enemies surround me? They trust in their wealth and boast of great riches. By paying a ransom to God. Redemption does not come so easily, for no one can ever pay enough to live forever and never see the grave. Listen to this, all you people. Those who are wise must finally die, just like the foolish and senseless, leaving all their wealth behind. The grave is their eternal home, where they will stay forever. They may name their estates after themselves, but their fame will not last. Listen to this, all you people. Pay attention, listen. The only riches we have at any time in our lives are those we have already invested in our eternal heritage. Lord Jesus, help us to invest less on earth where we must leave it and more in heaven where we will retain it forever. Amen. Amen. Continue in worship. Let's sing our first hymn, number 581. Lord, those love through humble service. Let's sing. As we worship, grant us vision to 
ask our ushers to come forward to move amongst us this morning for his tithes and our offerings. provider, the tithes and the offerings we give to you today, remind us of how you provide our financial needs. You've given us work, so we have income to tithe from work that uses our abilities, and you enabled us to have those abilities through natural gifting as well as training and education. You've provided opportunities to invest 
what you have given us. We thank you for prospering us so we can support your ministries in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. <clears throat> We have two scripture readings today. <clears throat> Both are from the New Living Translation. And uh, the first one is Hebrews 11, verses 8 through 10. <clears throat> Excuse me. It was by faith that Abraham obeyed when God called him to leave home and go to another land that God would give him as his inheritance. He went without knowing where he was going. And even when he reached the land, God promised him he lived there by faith for he was like a foreigner living in tents. And so did Isaac and Jacob, who inherited the same promise. Abraham was confidently looking forward to a city with eternal foundations, a city designed and built by God. The second reading is from Luke chapter 12, verses 13 to 21. You can find this on page 905 of the Pew Bible if you wish to follow along. This is the parable of the rich fool. Then someone called from the crowd, Teacher, please tell my brother to divide our father's <coughs> estate with me. Jesus replied, Friend, who made me a judge over you to decide such things as that? Then he said, Beware, guard against every kind of greed. Life is not measured by how much you own. And then he told them a story. A rich man had a fertile farm that produced fine crops. He said to himself, what should I do? I don't have room for all my crops. Then he said, I know, I'll tear down my barns and build bigger ones. Then I'll have room enough to store all my wheat and other goods. And I'll sit back and say to myself, my friend, you have stored enough away for years to come. Now take it easy, eat, drink, and be merry. But God said to him, you fool, you will die that this very night. Then who will get everything you worked for? Yes, a person is a fool to store up earthly wealth, but not have a rich relationship with God. This is the word of the Lord. And thanks be to God. Thank you, Billy. Let's pray. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. You know, it's amazing to realize all the many things we have done in our lives over the years without really understanding completely where God was leading us. If you think about this for a moment, for example, for the parent, that God would bestow the most precious gift in the world, a child, and not give us a manual on how to raise that child. Oh yes, we have Dr. Spock, but what does he know? <laughs> Heck, even God himself had trouble with his kids. God wasn't able to inspire much obedience or faithfulness in Adam and Eve, and quite frankly, they did not have any better outcome with their children either. Or going out on your first date with someone that you really believe could be the one. I remember meeting Donna 44 years ago in the college library and asking her for a date after a series, though, of stumbled and bumbled questions I asked of her initially, trying to make, you know, small talk no doubt she saw me as just a, a lonely dude on campus with no real idea of saying yes to my offer of a date. I asked her awkwardly, sort of like this, I said, are you, are you willing to go out with me? I asked, trembling. <laughs> um, you know, there's no real manual for how to had a, or a book on dating, uh, really, when you buy some gadget or something, there is a manual, right? You use it, or for us, some of us, we don't use it. But with the most complicated gift, relationships, there's no manual. 
or is there? But at least in my case with Donna, and I'm quite certain in your own, once we decided to go out together and date and then fall slowly in love, much of the worry and uncertainty of our young lives seemed to dissipate. I, for one, felt a, a freedom I had never felt before. A freedom that, quite frankly, was refreshing and trusting, faithful. Now that's what it was, faithful. In life, as when we are young, and now as we have aged and are in our mature years, we ask ourselves often, what am I going to do with my life today? Lord, what do you expect me to do? You say, Danny, I don't know what I'm going to do. I'm just not sure. But let's remind each other that God knows what, we, what he is going to do with us. And as followers of Jesus, we must continually examine our attitudes towards Jesus to see if we are willing to go out in an area of our lives, perhaps feeling a bit vulnerable, perhaps with trust in him totally and his word as our manual. Can you imagine? Can you imagine waking up every day and knowing that you can trust God in everything you embark on that day? Imagine that for a moment. This kind of spiritual thinking then keeps you and I in constant wonder, doesn't it? And why? <laughs> because we don't know what God will do next. We just don't know. Every day of our lives, there is a new opportunity to trust God by going out, by stepping out with him where we are confident confidence, and it's built on him stronger each day like it might have been when perhaps we were younger. Come back with me now to the conversation Jesus had with the rich fool, where Jesus hears a voice from the crowd wanting him to, to help divide an estate between two brothers. These kinds of problems fell under the job description of a rabbi in those days, and in 60 AD, Luke wrote about it. These tasks still may be a rabbi's job for all I know, but don't call me with this problem. Call Dan Geary or Carol Jones if you want to settle a dispute. But I imagine when you holler something at Jesus and ask him to settle something, or explain something, he will then go to a, well, to a much higher plane in order to answer the question. You can hear that in Jesus. He starts here in our text by explaining about the correct attitude about the accumulation of wealth. In Luke's gospel and his writings, he's saying that Jesus' message was that we are to look at our lives as being much more important than material stuff. Remember when your mother taught you when speaking to someone, never point a finger at them for any reason? Remember that lesson? Well, I'm uh, theologizing here, but Jesus placed his finger, as one commentary suggests, on the very heart of his questioner. Isn't that how God works on us when we do bring things to him in prayer? He responds in the same way. He shows us how we need to change and grow in our attitude towards the problem or the issue. Many times it is not the answer we are looking or hoping for, however. But here is what it does do. It helps us to trace God's very hand in our lives, to trace it and to then trust that every day. So here's a question. What constitutes 
the good life, you ask. What is the, the good life? Is it having a lot of money and counting on it for our joy and our happiness? And how do we include our very trust in Jesus in all the steps we take each day along our pathway? Can we depend on Christ Jesus every day when our feet hit the ground each morning? Do you trust him, friend? The man writes that he was a recovering materialist. It represented for him years of searching for purpose and meaning. He said, I wanted to be a financially independent man as well as do the, the right thing in my life, he wrote. He wrote, it felt right for a while. But the man said, the life philosophy of a moral materialist turned out to not be enough. He discovered that he had no real purpose to last a lifetime, you see. One day he was led to Christ by a friend. He didn't stop being a moralist or materialist, however. He simply added Christ to his list of existing life philosophies. That Jesus could simply fill in the, the missing pieces which caused his lack of purpose and his joy. This man looked up and then studied materialism. He defined it as this way. He said the theory, he said materialism is the theory that physical well-being and worldly possessions constitute the highest value and the greatest good in life. Well, this is the exact opposite of the Christian life. But you ask, what is the, the dominant value of the world, Danny? Most people will tell you that if they simply had more money, things would be so much better. Ask most people, and they'll tell you this as well. Or people will argue that you can be a materialist and a Christian at the same time. You can't. Because every decision is based on your wealth and your ability to maintain that balance sheet and not the faithful reliance on Christ and his word can't work. A man once told me that he didn't have time to read the entire Bible to find the answers for his life. I told him that just to just read the words of Jesus, there are 31,426 recorded words of the Lord I told him to follow every one of them. Trust them completely. I said, you'll find your answers. In our text in Hebrew, Abraham, whose life was filled with faith and trust in God, moved at God's command, not the market, but of God's command. I occasionally play golf with a man who looks at the Dow Jones industrial average on his phone throughout our round of golf. I can actually see his mood ebb and flow as the market fluctuates during that four-hour round of golf. Seriously. Abraham, at God's command, hearing him in his heart, he left home and went to another land. He obeyed without questioning. He surrendered to the will of God. He went to this place completely unknown to him, believing in the, the covenant that God made with him, trusting it. How refreshing it is to, to read this story. Surrender and obedience to the point that he was even willing to sacrifice his son, Isaac. That is... All in, folks. That's all in. I'm sorry. <laughs> That's the best testimony you could hear. What a picture. That is going out with God every day. Walking out the door each day in complete trust. He asked Abraham to give up 
all his comfortable surroundings, all his friends, all his earning capacity and influence in order to carry out his will and even to give up his son. When we refuse to go out there with the Lord, not trust in this journey of faith every day, we are really, frankly, trying to have the best of both worlds, aren't we? The kingdom of God and the world which is passing away. I know you hate to hear that, but the world is passing away. That our eyes are never satisfied. That contentment in our soul eludes us and we become just like the rich fool. Verse 17 of Luke. The rich man woke up one day and asked himself, what should I do? (laughs) He didn't have room to, to store all his crops on this huge fertile farm that he owned and operated. Without any spiritual consideration about this dilemma, he said, oh, 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 I know what I'll do. I'm going I'm to tear down the old barns, he said, and build bigger barns. That's what I'll do. Then I'll have all the, the room I need to store all my crops and all my stuff. Then I'll feel safe and secure, he said. Proverbs 27 and 20 says, Death and destruction are never satisfied, and neither are the eyes of man. Possessions are not a sin. They're not. If I have plenty, does it mean I'm not a Christian? No, not at all. Not if you have received him as Savior and Lord in your life and are led to share that bounty. No. But it does mean that over a lifetime, you will reap judgment if you live by the values of this world and not of God. The Bible says a man reaps what he sows, Galatians 6, 7. Materialism is a sin. Possessions are not a sin. But an obsession for possessions is a sin. So what happened to the rich man in Jesus' story? Well, let's go back again to the parable. The story is found exclusively in Luke, no other gospel, and it is the the context of inheritance and who gets what. According to Jewish custom, the older son in a family of two received two-thirds of his father's possessions. The voice or the man that is asking Jesus the question here is probably the younger brother. What seems to be implied here is that the older brother hasn't divided anything of the inheritance with his younger brother. Jesus, well, he refuses to judge between them, noting specifically that Covetousness is a threat to both men. Then Jesus tells the story of the rich man who embraces the excesses in his life when he is putting his feet up on his big deck and he's eating and he's drinking and he's chilling. What happens? Oh, (laughs) shucks, his good times are interrupted by the word of God. I hate when that happens. God calls the man a fool for not trusting him. He says, okay, you're going to die this very night. Your soul is now required of you, the Bible says. God asks, will all of this money be used well? And who will get all that you have worked so hard to store up? Will treasures and collectibles somehow draw us closer to God? No. Because they are laid up for us, you see, and not the Lord. The rich man died before he could begin to use what he had. Planning for life before death? Wise. But, as one commentary suggests, neglecting life 
after death is disastrous. You will, my friends, enter eternity empty-handed. So did you trust Jesus this morning when you woke up? I guess enough to come here today, but did you shut your eyes this morning and say to the Lord, speak to me today, O oh God. Show me a, a sign. Help me with my hurt. Dispel my worry. Take away my guilt and my shame. Did you ask those questions today? When I was a kid, I remember wanting to have ice cream every night when the Jack and Jill ice cream truck would come around the neighborhood. You remember those days? With five boys in the house at one time, it was rare my parents had the money for even the occasional Jack and Jill stop. Oh, yeah, other kids were at that truck every night getting something. I'll never forget it. I used to watch them. But every now and then, Mom would come out of the back door and she'd tell us, close your eyes and hold out your hands. That, my friends, was the promise of something really special that was to come that night when that happened with Mom. You see, I trusted my mom. So I, along with my brothers, closed our eyes and held out our hands. And she would put a quarter in each of our hands. Sometimes it was only 15 cents. Whatever amount she would give us, I was ready to take. That is how it should be with Jesus. Our willingness to go out there with the Lord Jesus, our Heavenly Father, every day, not expecting a certain outcome, but trusting in His sovereignty in our hearts, with our hands and our hearts open, not trusting our lives to, to artificial intelligence or to some search engine. That is what living a distant life of faith is like, relying on artificial knowledge, relying on things and poor advice and bad habits. That's distant. A closeness with Jesus is a faith that says, I'm, I am willing to receive whatever he wants to give me or the willingness not to have what he does not want me to have. Donna didn't exactly close her eyes the day I asked her to go out and have coffee with me that afternoon. But she trusted based on her close relationship with Christ, that he would show her what could be. And I'm grateful to God for that. Let me close with the words of Elizabeth Elliot, one of my heroes of the faith. From the greatest of all gifts, salvation in Christ, to the material blessings of an ordinary day, she says, of hot water, a pair of legs that work, a cup of coffee, a job to, to go to, and the strength to do it. Every good gift comes down from the Father of lights. Every one of them to be received gladly. Sometimes we want things we are not meant to have because the Father who loves us says no. Faith trusts that no. Faith is willing to have what God is not willing to give. And Eliot says, faith does not insist upon an explanation. It is enough to know his promise to give what is good, that he knows so much more about that than we do. Do you trust that today, folks? Do you claim that in your life today? I pray that you do. Not just today, but tomorrow. Are we glad he says no to what we want and yes to what we need? Well, not always. Not always. 
a new marriage. No, he says, honor the one you're in. Healing, Lord, heal me, he says, to learn through the pain first. I need money, Jesus. I need money. And Jesus says, as Max Lucado suggests, treasure the unseen. God knows much more than we do about this life, and he will repeat. He will get us through it. Do you need to hear that today? That God is in control? Do you, do you need to hear that? I do. I do. Corey Ten Boom used to say, when the train goes through a tunnel and the world gets dark, do you jump out? No. <laughs> You don't jump out of the train. You sit still and you trust the engineer to get you through. To get you through. Go out with Christ. Every day of your lives. Don't jump out. Don't give up. He's in control. Would you rise, please, and turn to uh, a great affirmation of faith found in your hymnal, number 889, as we affirm this, this scripture this morning, number 889. This is from 1 Timothy, the second chapter, verses 5 and 6, and then uh, 1, 15, and then 316, co-mingled together, number 889. Let's affirm our faith together, shall we? There is one God and there is one mediator, Christ Jesus, <clears throat> who came as a ransom for all to whom we now testif testify. The saying is sure and worthy of all acceptance that Jesus Christ came into the world to save sinners and was manifested in the flesh Vindicated in the spirit, seen by angels, proclaimed among the nations, believed in throughout the world, taken up in glory. Great indeed is the mystery of the gospel. Amen and amen. You may be seated. Thank you. It is good that we affirm all of that, affirm our faith, affirm our love and our trust in God and in Jesus Christ. So we open up the room and we ask that, um, that you would want to petition. What prayer petitions do you have today? What do we pray for today as a, as a church? What do we pray for today as a nation? Do we have friends that need prayer? Do we have situations that need prayer? Do we have uh, uh, celebrations and joys? I've got a microphone. It works. And I'm asking for prayers, petitions, joys, celebrations. Mary? Uh, Danny, this is a, a joy. As many of you are familiar with the well that is in Downingtown, that is a, a mission outreach. Tonight, if you can stay up this late, on Channel 6 News, they're doing <clears throat> a, a, a little uh, thing about the well tonight on Channel 6 News at 11 o'clock. Yeah, nice. So I think Downingtown should really be happy. Amen. Yes, you may. Donna? Um, I'm going to ask for prayers for a gentleman I don't know, but uh, one of my friends is really concerned about her brother. His name is Richie, and um, he won't leave his house. He's um, fearful and full of anxiety, and she's really worried about him. So his name is Richie. Please lift him up. Amen. Amen. Richie, the well is, uh, was a dream of Pastor Steve Morton that came to pass, and uh, um, I encourage you to, to watch that. John Miller. Dan, last week you talked about how important mentors are in your life. Yes. And two of the most important mentors of mine were Tom and Ann Trega. Ann is still in the hospital. I'm asking that you would please continue to have her in your prayers. Amen. Amen. Ann is getting a little stronger, but uh, needs our prayers. 
for sure. Others, who do we pray for? What do we pray about? Celebrations. Let's pray together as a church. Well, it feels a little simple, but I want to praise and thank God for the beauty of the earth and for the rain that he sent us this week. Amen. 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 And it's okay if it rains Monday because the golf courses are closed. <laughs> That's fine. It's poor. It doesn't matter. Thank you. Today is Paul DeGuardio's birthday, I see, so, uh, and I see he's not here, so I'll deal with him later. But uh, birthday celebrations to our uh, director of finance. Phil? Thank you, Dan. Uh, I, I would ask that you would uh, please continue prayers and diligent prayers for my brother-in-law, Walt, who uh, is starting to decline. He's got terminal uh, cancer. And um, he has been a real inspiration for me and, and Clara and uh, our family because he <clears throat> has absolutely no quit in him. And um, I did mention that to him the other night on his 70th birthday. Um, also for my sister Colette, we just uh, lost my other brother-in-law three weeks ago. He dropped dead in his kitchen. And uh, so I asked prayers for my sister-in-law Colette and their family as well. And uh, that, that, that'll do it. Thank you, Phil. While he's a member of Grove United Methodist Church and uh, a great lover and believer in Jesus, and Chuck was as well. Scott. Um, I just want to, it's a, a joy that all of the uh, PA Bowmans are nice and healthy after yes. their, yeah. their second uh, run through of COVID. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Praise be to God. Praise be to God. Thank you for that. Thank you for that. We're coming back to Mary Barringer again. Yeah, here, take it. <laughs> just, just, just finish, okay? Just stand up and finish. <laughs> I really feel that we should pray for Phil and Kara as a congregation. In all the years that I've known them, they've both been through so much with their families, and Phil has a big family, so there's a lot, and they're just so strong in their faith. They so, are. Phil and Kara, our prayers are going out to you. Amen. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you. Yeah, Phil is one of eight kids, and so there's a lot of Starowskis, and, uh, and that's, that's a good thing. But prayers for you both as you continue to be the, the cornerstone of that church and of that, uh, that family. I want to pray for all of you. Uh, I told you last week I prayer walked uh, this entire uh, sanctuary, and I know where everybody sits, um, but I, I didn't do it this week. But I thank God for all of you that you come each and every Sunday. This is a joy, and uh, I celebrate you. And uh, I continue to pray for all of you, not just for the flock, but for all of you individually. And uh, I'm just thankful that you're here. Let's, let's go to the Lord in prayer. And Father, you've heard the petitions, you've heard the concerns, you've, you've heard the joys, and you've heard the lament in our hearts, dear God, for communities... Uh, that need a, a building, um, an outreach to sick relatives, to uh, recovering from sickness, <clears throat> from concern about even, even someone we don't even really know. Uh, God, you know all of these things. And for the, the things that we didn't bring up with a a proclamation in front of a microphone, God, we take this next 15 seconds to pray on that in silence. Lord, we're giving you these names. We're giving you these circumstances. 
We're giving you <clears throat> all these concerns, God, because we can't handle them. And you say in your word, Lord, that you are the great burden bearer, that you carried the cross, that you carried each one of our burdens, Lord. So we're faithful. When our feet hit the ground, when we leave this place, God, we're all in. We're all in. Thank you, God, for Jesus. For Jesus, who, when his friends said, what do we pray about? How do we pray? Jesus taught them this prayer. Say with me. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. For those visiting today, I thank you. I thank God for you today. Young people, old people, middle people, good to see your faces, everyone smiling. Let's stand and sing our last hymn, shall we? It's found in your bulletin. The lyrics are found in your book, and the day will lead us in guitar. I originally put this in. Uh, I love the song, uh, but the tune that's in the hymnal I didn't like, so I, I switched the tune on it. But I realized that the words are quite a mouthful. It, it's, a, it's a wonderful thing for our message today, which is the church is really the center of time, treasure, and talent. you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and give you peace in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen and amen.